Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Tony, welcome back to the podcast. It is just so great to catch up with you. I treasure our time together. I enjoy these conversations, Carrie. You you really stretch my thinking when you do this. You know, I was actually this is the question I have for you. I know you have questions for me, but as you look back at all of this podcasting you've done over the last number of years, you've learned a lot from your guests, but how how has this podcasting changed you? How has it changed your leadership the most? Oh, Nobody has ever asked me that. That's a great question. And by the way, if you hear um, background noise, listeners, Tony knows I've I've got uh, a crew working right outside my basement window where I do this from world headquarters, uh, redoing my backyard right now. So that is the sound of gravel (laughs) pretty much against my window, I think. Anyway, (laughs) sometimes I think people can hear it and then they can't. But anyway, uh, what have I learned? Um, I think I become a much better listener. Uh, I think I've become more curious. I think I've probably become more open-minded, realizing that really, really smart people don't always agree with each other and that one doesn't have to be wrong to be right. And I hope it stoked my curiosity. One of my heroes, he'll be on again this year if he isn't already by the time you hear it. And, And two of our all, like he's the only one I think who has two top 10 episodes all time on the podcast, but Gordon McDonald. I think Gordon's 82 this year. And so we catch up personally and also on this show and for other things. He is like curious at 82. And I I got a few decades to go before I hit 82. But like, I hope I'm really curious. And you and I have talked about that, right? Like age and cynicism are frequent companions. Yep. And so I think this has made me a little less cynical and a little more open. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. Well, you've taught us some so much through the years through your conversations, Carrie. So I was just curious, what have you learned through this? So that's good. Thank you. And I really do love doing it. And it just never gets old. And no two are the same. Like often these days, because I have multiple shows, I'll be preparing, and this one does six episodes a month, Tony. I'll be preparing, you know, up to 10 interviews a month. And sometimes that's reading books. Sometimes it's just asking questions. But like, I'm like, wow, this isn't 500 episodes in. I'm not bored. Hmm. That's good. That's good. It says a lot. So it now sure it's time to pick your brain. Um, <laughs> you you were saying you haven't flown in the last year either. We're going to talk a lot of shop here about online in particular, but you haven't flown. You've been totally digital. You had to pivot because you were an in-person consulting company, right? Yes, we were. And we will be. In fact, we were. Mm-hmm. you and I were just chatting. Uh, by the time this airs, I will be have been on the plane a couple of times, I think, uh, to be, get back on site with churches. And, you know, the process we learned when, when we pivoted last year, the process is still good. And uh, people, I mean, we've served over 80 churches over the last year, all wow. virtually. And the process itself still works online very well, but I miss just that face-to-face engagement. And this sounds weird coming from an introvert, I know, Carrie, but my goodness, Mm -hmm. I just, I'm craving just that interaction with leaders and uh, teams again. And uh, it's, it's the moments, you know, during the breaks, over lunch, over meals that I am just absolutely missing. And 
you know, part of that curiosity thing for me is just being able to visit different places too. And so that Mm. fuels some of the thinking and creativity, I think, and how I look at life. Uh, And so I'm looking forward to getting back to that. You can often tell an awful lot just by walking into a building, can't you? Mm -hmm. Like, doesn't that tell a story? It sure does. It sure does. Uh, uh, Locally here, I walked into a church um, just in the last couple of weeks, Carrie, and uh, it's it's uh, it was tired. And I thought, Mm. oh, that's so unfortunate because it's the greatest mission in the world. And yet the facility was tired. And I, I, want, I wanted to explore more. Uh, this is not a church we're working with. Um, this is, I just happen to be in the community. Uh, and so, yeah, the, you're, you're absolutely right. And then you walk into some other facilities and you think, oh my goodness, God is doing something amazing in this place yeah. because of the way they're so intentional with how they're using their space. So yes, I'm looking forward to getting back on site with churches because that's certainly I think going to help us more effectively serve the churches that we're working with. Well, and for business leaders too, we have a growing number of business leaders listening. I mean, that's true of corporate offices, it's true of restaurants, it's true of little small shops and companies, factories. Like you walk in and it gives a vibe, it gives a message, right? So so would you say, and I'm I'm not asking of your past 80 clients to ask for a discount. Um, at this point, but, <laughs> they did but get a discount. Say, <laughs> <laughs> they got a discount. Okay. Was was there any um, diminishment you would say of your ability to really diagnose and consult because it was virtual? No, not at all. And uh, what was amazing, Carrie, is I just th- this is the technology has advanced so much that I would actually argue when it got to the strategic conversations, the interaction was stronger on video because everybody's at their computer, everybody's looking at each other on the screen. And it, I think it just put all the leaders on a level playing field. So everybody felt the freedom to engage fully. And then when we're having strategy conversations and talking about structure and things like that uh, for uh, the churches that we're serving, those key conversations, you can still have those online very effectively. And again, tools using iPad to capture pictures and thoughts and things like that. So that that wasn't the challenge at all. It was just being face to face with people and something that you lose in the dynamic of just being in the room with other people. Yeah, we just did a six hour retreat with our team, which was all virtual with um, some leaders in California. So there were like a dozen of us on for... Yeah, six hours. And I mean, you're tired at the end of it, but nobody is like checking their phone. Nobody, like you were dialed in for that time. So I would imagine you ironically would get greater engagement. Yeah, it was uh, it was fascinating, and we heard this several times over the last twelve months. Uh, the leaders, you know, on the front end, were just dreading two full days being on Zoom, essentially, and then at the end of it, the 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 response was. I'm kind of surprised. I'm energized by these conversations. And so uh, that was encouraging. And again, I'm just so grateful because what, maybe just five years ago, if if this would have shut down uh, our uh, culture like it did, um, the technology was not to the place where we could continue what we were doing, serving churches. And so I'm just so grateful that we were able to press forward. And I think we did some really good work with churches in this last season, especially as it relates to not only dealing with the immediate crisis that all churches were facing, but thinking even in the middle of that about some uh, incredible next steps that they need to be considering. And it sounds like related to some of where our conversation may go today, Carrie. Yeah. So let's, let's go there. I mean, nobody was expecting what we got in March of 2020, but here we are, you know, emerging, particularly in the U S onto the other side of it, apparently. Um, we'll see what happens globally. It's a different picture, but, um, were many leaders you work with caught off guard by this? And if so, in what ways? And I'm not talking about, Oh, global pandemic. I'm saying like, Whoa, we were not ready for this moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I think almost everybody was caught off guard except for maybe yeah. Zoom, um, but they just happened to be in the right place at the right time, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, this was, uh, what didn't surprise me was the fact that people were caught off guard, Carrie. What actually surprised me more was how quickly churches adapted. And it's just, you know, for- Like in a positive way? Yeah, for organizations yeah. that are not notoriously known for rapid, helpful change, 
Churches pivoted pretty quickly in a number of ways related to their services, getting those online, shifting discipleship strategy, and particularly getting community groups and, you know, the more traditional churches that we were working with, getting their Sunday school classes online, uh, giving online. I mean, every aspect of the ministry really for the church themselves, I want to talk about maybe what didn't get online and yeah, some yeah, of the definitely challenge we see going forward. but. I actually think the church generally did very well adapting in a very difficult situation. Hmm. Hey, that's a great place to start on um, positive news because there have been so many challenges. What are some areas that were harder for adoption for church leaders you were working with? Yeah, so I think going into this, uh, pre-COVID days, I know it's kind of hard to think back to that point, but there was a real wrestling I was hearing from pastors and church leaders related to digital strategies. And the concern, I think, was if we lean too heavily into this, think about streaming services, getting content online, uh, engaging with people online. I think the concern was if we lean into that too heavily, people will not join us in person for physical gatherings. And right. for those for those church leaders, I think they were a bit caught off guard uh, when when this happened. I, as a matter of fact, I remember it was just in the week or two before everything shut down last March. And one of the churches I was working with, they, they had just decided we aren't go- we aren't going to go online because if we do this, it's not, it's not going to allow people to come to our church. And um, I, they may have been caught off guard, but I'm so proud of that church too, because again, they pivoted and they've made some great strides moving forward. But here's what's fascinating, Carrie, is that whole premise of would digital compete with physical even before the pandemic? We surveyed, this is in 2019, so this is right before the pandemic. We surveyed it was 175 churches and found that growing churches are much more likely to share video content through live streaming, on demand, YouTube, Vimeo, and so on. And specifically, 85% of growing churches were sharing video content online compared to only 49% of declining churches. So not quite twice as many growing churches were leveraging video content. And so again, that whole premise that if we, if we lean too heavily into digital, if we lean too heavily into online, it's going to prevent people from coming to physical gatherings. The data at least says the direct opposite. Yeah. That, what, what do you think is behind that? Because I mean, I've listened to business wars. If you follow that podcast, their study, but of, I think it was home Depot this whole idea that that clicks lead to bricks, because that was a big fear, you know, 20 years ago with Home Depot, with the rise of the internet. It's like, if we put our lawnmowers online, no one's going to come into the store and buy a lawnmower, right? And then what they realized is, no, actually clicks lead to bricks. And Walmart discovered the same thing, right? When they were trying to go head to head with Amazon, it's like, no, if we have a really robust internet presence, it actually boosts on-store sales. Is that what you're seeing in the data? A- absolutely. And I mean, we've seen it at the Unstuck Group. I mean, I've had purple people tell me, why are you putting all of this content out there for free? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, in the last generation, folks would gather all that content, find a publisher, put it in a book, and try to sell as many books as possible. Um, we are able to serve many, many more churches because we offer that content free access. It's all online. And it's all in digital format. And because we've done that, people become more familiar with how we serve churches. And we are actually able to work with more churches because of that. And we're starting to see the very front end of churches leveraging that same approach to connect with new people. One of the churches we talked with recently, Carrie, um, they have started, even pre-COVID, they were starting to you know, kind of dip their foot into the water as it relates to digital strategy. And certainly COVID even accelerated their focus on making sure that they really are becoming a hybrid church where it's the same ministry strategy, both in physical gatherings and online. 
And over the last 12 months, leveraging that digital strategy, they've been able to celebrate over 600 people coming to Christ and getting baptized, going public with their faith. And it's just so encouraging to me. Now, some of the data we're going to talk about, again, this is a, a stretch for many churches, but we're seeing, we're starting to see some churches kind of help take the lead, help us catch a vision for what this can look like. And I actually think some of what we've learned during the pandemic is it's going to make the church healthier on the other side. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So we're going to jump into the data, Tony, but I want to play that game with you that you alluded to. Okay. Those people who said, why are you offering all this stuff free online? I had a really good friend because you and I work in similar space these days, right? We used to work at a church. These days I serve church and business leaders. You serve church leaders and we run companies, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a friend of mine who I love, good friends with him to this day. He pulled me aside about seven, eight years ago before this was what I do full time. And he said, Carrie, I want to tell you the business mistake you're making. You're putting all your stuff out there for free. You should put that <laughs> behind a paywall, right? And that is one way to think, right? That yeah. you are sharing the secret sauce. Now, you know, our unofficial slogan in the company is we want our free stuff to be better than most people's paid stuff. And then you if go. you get a pay, if you buy a product, which I think only one or 2% of my audience ever does, you know, we want you to be so wowed by it that it becomes amazing. But we just have so much traffic, right? Every month on the podcast and the blog that it's a tiny fraction of the people who buy, but those who buy hopefully have the ultimate experience. What is right about, because that is not, if you had, if you had pulled you and me together in 2005 and said, here's a business model, we probably both would have shot it down. Right? Yeah. Maybe like it's a paradigm shift. Maybe. It's a paradigm shift. So why does that work? Why would why would I hire you? If I'm listening to every episode of your podcast, reading your blog, I get I subscribe to your email list, I get your quarterly reports, which I printed out here. Mm -hmm. Why would I ever hire you? Why would I ever pay you money if I can get all that stuff for free? Yeah. So uh what we can do when we work with individual churches, it becomes a more personalized process, obviously. And so we can get to know the context of the community that they're trying to serve. We can get to know their team. We can get to know their unique ministry strategy. And so we're able to bring our experience of working with hundreds and hundreds of churches to really focus and hone in on how, you know, where is God taking your church and what, what are your next steps need to look like? And what is the team you need to have in place to accomplish that? And you can't do that through content. I mean, you can share principles, you can share philosophies, we can share what we're learning from the broad scope of churches that we're engaging with, but we can't help the individual church through that approach. And so, yeah, it's it really is. I I didn't go into creating a content platform thinking we would end up doing what we're doing today, Carrie. But this is, uh, I guess, God's providence for sure on uh, my life and our team because of that platform. Now we're able to serve churches around the world, and it's uh, it's uh, so encouraging. And I just am so humbled by the opportunity at the same point because again, I didn't set out to do this. <laughs> Oh, I hear you. And just for leaders, and, and thanks for playing along with that, Tony, because uh, I, and for the record, I have, this is an unsolicited commercial. Um, I have brought you in a couple times as lead pastor when I was at Conexus, and we've connected on a number of other fronts and actually paid you money because I knew what you said. I read your blog. You didn't have a podcast at the time, the first time I hired you, but I'm like, I think Tony can help us. And I think for those of you who are afraid to share the point is, yeah, people are going to learn about you. Like I would have known about you if you didn't give anything away for free, but I had a staffing challenge that you really helped me solve. And it's funny because we just hired again in the company. I still use that little strengths wheel leading yeah. from your strength thing. You first showed me um, basically the clock where you put your, and I'm still using that a decade later. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you were able to personalize it for me. And I think the same is true of courses, right? So yeah, some of that stuff you might be able to find in a blog post or, you know, 10-minute segment of a podcast. But what a course does or an online PDF or whatever you're offering, it focuses all of that in a very intentional way that's applicable. And it's like it goes from, you know, a broad light bulb to like a laser beam. And all of a sudden, your problem hopefully is solved. So that's right. is anything more on the model? Because I think this is still something a lot of business leaders and church leaders are trying to get their head around. 
Uh, that's a shot at it from my end. Any any shot at it from your end? Yeah, it's just uh, we we people are not just going to show up to our churches anymore. That is, I mean, it's it's a step in the spiritual journey, and we're going to talk about that more. It's a step, but they're just not going to show up to our doors on Sunday morning. And so somehow, I think it's around content and connections that we make with people. And I think, again, some of the, some, we can create some physical environments for some of that, but a lot of this, a lot of this work of, of developing relationship and building trust before people show up on Sunday morning, I think a lot of this uh, hard work is going to need to happen on digital platforms. And so, yeah, it's, uh, and again, I think there are a lot of parallels with what our two businesses are about. And certainly there are a lot, a lot of businesses that we could look to, to see the model actually works. And like I said, what I'm excited about now is we're starting to see some churches lean into this as well. I love it too. So one of my favorite emails to get is when you release your quarterly report. And just before we started recording, you sent me like hot off the press, not even in published form. But by the time I think this episode goes live, you'll be able to share these publicly. But but walk us through what we're seeing in in churches. So this is the Unstuck Church Report. I would highly recommend you sign up for it. I'm excited for it. And you track with leading churches where they're at. So do you want to walk us through that? And we'll link to that in the show notes. For those of you who are listening, you can go find that um, on my website. But walk us through, let's start with attendance. Yeah, so uh, by the way, what we did is we just we just pulled the data from the churches that we've worked with or have taken our assessment within the last 12 months. So what okay. it's showing us now is here's where the church is in the middle of COVID and comparing it to where we were prior to COVID. And what we're seeing is on average, churches have seen a decline in in-person attendance by close to 30%. Uh, and then on the flip side, this is, and again, this is goes to some of the conversation we've had already about how churches quickly pivoted and are beginning to leverage a little bit better online. What we've seen is churches in the last year have almost more than doubled the number of online views um, for their services. And that's up 123%. Is that compared to 2019, 2021? So whenever the church took the assessment, we asked them, what is your online, what are the number of online views that you're seeing today? And what were, what was that number exactly one year ago? Yeah. So you're starting to get real time comparisons online over online. Oh, wow. And that's up 123. So you're down in person, twenty eight percent, and even are you finding this too, Tony? I know this isn't in the data, but I, you know, I obviously talk to a lot of leaders like you do, and what I'm hearing, even for churches that would be fully open, or even other things, restaurants, you know, gyms that are fully open, they're like, well, we're back, but not really. Like people yeah. are going to movies, but they're not coming here. That most people say they're missing like somewhere between ten and thirty percent of their people are just gone even though they could be back that's right and that and i would say that's more for the smaller churches that we're engaging with uh maybe some of the mid-size sometimes the more rural churches that have had a higher percentage of people come back for in-person gatherings um, but the large especially more suburban or, or urban churches that we're working with carrie it's they're seeing anywhere from 30 to 50% of their pre-COVID attendance. So the smaller the church, the more likely it is that people are back gathering in person. That's right. Larger the church, the more there's just people who are gone. Which makes complete sense, right? Um, Yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, we've been, it's been pounded into us for the last number of months, large indoor in-person gatherings. It's not a safe place for us to be. And so the, you could look at it this way for, the smaller churches, uh, the pastors and church leaders that are listening, you actually have an advantage in this season, I think, of, over some of the larger churches, uh, not only practically because uh, there maybe are less restrictions as far as uh, COVID is concerned, but it's an opportunity for us to engage relationally f- uh, with people. And my goodness, after a year of isolation and being removed from other people, I think the opportunity for churches coming out of the pandemic to engage people. Again, I think people are going to be craving these opportunities. Mm. And I'm actually pr- praying that the church 
broadly sees a bit of a revival coming out of this because people are going to be looking for those opportunities to gather with other people again. That'd be awesome. One of the things that's down, t- tell us about baptism. Yeah, so this was uh, this is what I would have thought, Carrie, is if, if, uh, if anything, the number of new people that were connecting to our church and the number of baptisms would have experienced the same level of decline as we're seeing in our in-person attendance. But Hmm. what I saw in the data is the number of new people and the number of baptisms is actually much lower. The decline has been more significant than even the decline in in in-person attendance. So what that tells me then is the people we're re-engaging in our churches are folks that have been a part of our church. But if anything, right now in this season where churches are struggling, it's, it's about engaging people outside the church and outside the faith. It's about connecting with new people. And so I think here, this is an opportunity that uh, churches are going to have to revisit, again, not only their digital strategy, but even physical gatherings too. How are we going to not only re-engage the church and get them to come back, but how are we going to uh, have a strategy to engage folks that are outside the church and outside the faith as well. So that of all of the data in this most recent report, that was probably the most alarming for me. And it's what I sensed in my gut is, um, after, uh, after all these months, um, the churches are doing well, getting people to come back, but there's been so much focus there that we've kind of lost sight of our broader mission, right? Which is to make new disciples of Jesus. And so there, I think there's huge opportunity for the church in the coming months. So baptism's down 52%. And then the category is new people added to the church's database, down 35%. Is that, I've got brand new content with Mark Clark coming out right now as we speak at the Art of Better Reaching. And we talk about a digital engagement funnel. Is some of that like turning views into actual relationships? Churches are still trying to figure that out. That's right. We want we want churches to be thinking about how do we help people move from the broader community to becoming known. So one one great way to measure that is once we have a name and a and a contact, whether that's an email or a phone number or something like that. Um, that's an indication that we've helped people take that very first step from not even being interested or maybe not, not even being aware of your church and your ministry to making themselves known. And when that happens, of course, we can begin to shift our strategy and how we engage with that person and be much more intentional about how we're connecting with that person to hopefully encourage them to take another step. And so um, we used to talk about measuring first-time guests, and I think churches should still measure the number of first-time guests that are showing up on Sunday morning. But through these last 12 months, we've tried to challenge churches, let's go back even a few steps before that and think about helping someone, again, move from moving from being not interested in faith or the church to getting to a place where they become known to hopefully getting to a place where they become spiritually curious. And then hopefully at some point in the future, not only putting faith in Jesus, but actually engaging, connecting with the church. And this, it may be, you know, multiple steps in before they actually show up on Sunday morning, either for a service in our building or a service online. Yeah. So uh, have you seen like often in secular marketing marketplace language, we call those uh, lead magnets, right? So Mm -hmm. if I go to your website, it would be get the Q2 church, you know, unstuck church report, you know, sign up with your email. You've seen that it can be everything from join our newsletter to get 10% off if you register now and you have to give your email. What are churches doing in that area. And again, I have a whole unit on it in the Art of Better Reaching, so I definitely have opinions on that. But I I would love to know what are churches doing where you've seen some start to get traction in being able to turn a viewer into a connection? So right now I'm just, you know, watcher number 38 or 3,038 on YouTube or or on a website. How, How do you get to know that, oh, that's Carrie Newhoff? Like, what are some effective ways of doing that? Well, you hit on it. I think what, uh, you know, people just don't volunteer. I'm here. This is my name. Here's my phone number. 
You know, they don't they don't just volunteer that. When was the last time you got on a business's website and just said, "Oh, I'm visiting your website. My name is such and such, and here's my email address." You you don't do that. But what people do is when they see something that they sense would be of value to them, they will gladly actually give you their name and their contact information in exchange for whatever that that thing of value is. And my suspicion, and again, we're starting to see some churches that are gaining traction around this, Carrie, is the thing of value is probably going to be initially some bit of content that addresses a question that someone is asking in life. And that question may be related to relationships, marriage, parenting, financial health. I mean, even spiritual questions. I mean, there are people outside the church and outside the faith I know before I accepted Christ, I was asking some what I would I would characterize as pretty significant spiritual questions like how do I get God to love me and if I'm if I'm not perfect will God still love me and and questions like that. These are questions that I think normal people at some point in their journey through life begin to ask and if we can provide content that begins to address the questions of the person we're trying to reach, I think we're going to find that they're willing to, again, become known, to let us know who they are, and that will be an indication they've taken a, at least another step, a baby step toward faith and toward connecting with our church. Um, but this is actually stuff, churches need to have a strategy around this. Yeah, yeah. And then you need to you ha- need to have some metrics. You need to have some ways of monitoring whether that whether or not that strategy is working. So I know at the Unstuck Group again we practice this this type of strategy, and so we'll uh, hopefully based on this conversation, folks will subscribe to the Unstuck Church Report uh, that includes yeah, yeah. each quarter this data, and it's free. But you'll have to give us your name and your contact information <laughs> in order for us to deliver that to you. And I know as an example, over the last 90 days, we've connected with 1,400 new church leaders through that strategy. And so for us, those are church leaders now that have made themselves known to the Unstuck Group. And today, are they ready to hire us to come on site to help them with strategy and structure and everything that we do at the Unstuck Group? No. But they've taken a they've taken a first step in that direction, and so if they don't go any further, we're still going to serve them as best we can. But it's it's the way we've done this for years, Carrie. I know you have too. Um, but this is so new for churches, and you know my heart in this. It's not about growing the church; it's about helping more people have relationship with Jesus. And I just know how how much Jesus has changed everything in my life, my marriage, my parenting my purpose, my career now, um, he's transformed everything. He's transformed who I am as an individual. And I know that. I know what he's done for me. And I know there are so many people that they need Jesus in their life as well. And I want the church to be shrewd in this. I want them to be highly effective in engaging in today's culture people that not only live in physical spaces they're living quite a bit of their of their life online as well and i want the church to be effective in engaging people in those environments well i think seth godin calls it permission marketing right you have to earn their permission this is not a billboard billboards are not permission marketing it's like well i was driving down the highway and i happen to look at your billboard this is like no i give you tony morgan the unstuck group permission to send me emails from time to time and, you know, big chains were doing this and, you know, Lululemon's been doing this for years. But for a lot of local businesses, shop owners, um, you know, artisans uh, and uh, and churches, this is kind of new territory. And, um, you know, what I, what I appreciate about you, and, and this doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to write a 40,000 word book for an opt-in, right? Like it can no. be, it can be a, a three page PDF. But what I like about your reports, and again, this is starting to sound like a commercial for your stuff. So just understand, <laughs> Tony and I have been friends for I a long, long time. I did not expect that, Carrie, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, no, no. But but here's what you do well. Like I got I got a Word doc, which is awesome because this is in beta. But I know by the time it lands in my inbox and thousands of others, it'll be professionally formatted. It'll have some graphics. You, you put a couple of bucks into it, right? Like That's you right. And you put some thought into it. You've spell checked it. And so when I open it up on my iPad or on my my MacBook, 
it's like, oh, this communicates value. So even if, you know, find a volunteer designer and they can put something together like parenting tips or, or whatever. And, um, okay, that's, that's enough. You've, you've got on a hobby horse of mine, um, general givings up a little bit. Yeah. Just a little so, bit, 1.7%. Uh, yeah, th- this is interesting. I mean, uh, after a year of significant disruption for the church, churches are actually financially healthier than they were a year mm-hmm. ago. And yeah, I and cash I mean, in the bank is way up. Yeah, it's just amazing, Carrie. I mean, giving's up 1.7%. Churches have 22 weeks of cash reserves now set aside, which, by the way, I think that's a little high. Debt has been reduced in churches. Um, and so all of these factors suggest that churches are in a financially healthy place, which, you know, going back to last spring, I was very concerned for ministries around the world and the impact that this disruption would have. But they're in a they're in a better place financially now to the point that really i want churches to now begin thinking about what does god have for us next what's the mm. big kingdom impact that god has for us in the future because i think churches are at a place now it's not just financially healthy there's actually margin there that needs to be invested in the mission that god's given the church otherwise i think we're we're not we're not stewarding the resources that God has given our ministries well if it's just sitting in a bank someplace. So we're at a place now where we need to be reinvesting those resources to look forward into the future and to take the church where God wants to take the church. Yeah, and that that has been a question that's top of mind for every church, so many businesses, and it's been an FAQ on this show over the last year. In And I, people have different opinions, but in your view, Knowing what we know now that pandemics do happen, stock markets do crash, what would you say, if, if I ask you, Tony, tell me how much cash I should have in the bank as an organization, what would you say for the average church? Yeah, so this I'm not telling you anything that we're not practicing at the Unstuck Group, um, but we set aside about 12 weeks, three months worth yeah. of operating expenses. These are the fixed costs, salaries, things like that. Um, that we know would be difficult to change uh, immediately. We set aside that amount of money, which I'm grateful we did coming into the <laughs> yeah. uh, pandemic. You know, you just think about having that rainy day fund, and it was pouring there for uh, mm-hmm. for many of us. So I'm glad we had that. And um, uh, it, that amount of money, what I have found, um, and you know, I've been through the recession, uh, Great Recession of 2008. Now the pandemic. Um, it, what it does is it buys you some time so that you don't have to make immediate drastic changes to your organization. We didn't have to lay anybody off when this hit last year. It, it buys you some time to make some of the mm. adjustments that are re- required. But I think any more than that, then you're not, you know, again, you're not stewarding the resources God's provided your ministry to actually expand the kingdom to be on mission, Mm -hmm. to be making new disciples of Jesus. We need to be reinvesting those resources to accomplish the mission God's given our church. Too much can make you lazy too, right? Complacent. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, you uh, lazy, uh, maybe not as creative. You're not thinking about some of the innovation and change that might be required for you to expand your mission impact. Uh, So I think there are a lot of factors you, you don't want to be too comfortable, I think. Otherwise, no. you start to rely on your own effort, and we're not relying on God. And so should we, you know, just blind faith, be assuming we can live paycheck to paycheck in our churches and God's just going to provide? No. I think we need to plan ahead, and it's a biblical concept. Uh, we need to be wise, wise stewards of the resources God's given us. But there, too much, I don't think, is being wise e- either. So mm-hmm. we, if, if God's given us the resources, we need to make sure we're investing wisely. So last thing I want to touch on, and then we got like a bunch of questions, man, time's flying. I knew, I knew this could be a three hour conversation <laughs> when you get you and I going on this stuff. Cause we just, we just nerd out. So if you're not a nerd, you're long gone. But if you are like Tony and I, 
and you love drilling down on this stuff, man, welcome, welcome to the show. Um, so on the very final page, you've got your little, I'll see if people can see it, but you've got your, uh, what do you call that? Church health? Um, yeah. So uh, in the Unstuck Church book, we, uh, I wrote about the seven phases of the church life mm-hmm. cycle. And um, what we've S- done similar is- Similar to Les McEwen's predictable success. That's right. For those of that's you right. who know that and I, framework, in fact, but adapted I, I to met, church. In the book, I mentioned- Les McEwen and several others that have used kind of this life cycle framework, right. not only as it relates to business in the business context, but specifically for churches. And so we talk about these seven phases beginning with launch and then momentum growth and then strategic growth. The pinnacle of this life cycle is sustained health. And that's where we want to help churches get and stay for as long as possible. But on the declining side of the life cycle, it's maintenance and then pre- preservation, and then life support. And so when the book came out a few years ago, we made available another assessment. It's called the Unstuck Church Assessment. We made that available, again, for free. Um, last time I looked, over 15,000 churches have taken that assessment, Carrie. Wow. And what we have seen, it's I mean, there's some promise there. Uh, there are some churches on the left side that are moving towards sustained health. There are some churches that are, are based on how they're responding. They're telling us we are in sustained health. Mm-hmm. But time and time again, what we've seen is almost 85% of churches tell us they are on the declining side of that life cycle, either in maintenance, preservation, or life support. And time and time again, the biggest chunk, 60% of churches have told us we're in maintenance. And so and that's what you see. 62% are barely maintaining. That's right. You got 6% in launch, four in momentum or growth, five in strategic growth, 2% in predictable success. So what does that up to? 10, 15, 17% are on the healthy side and 83% are on the big slide down to life yeah, support. That's right. And wow. so, uh, number one, this is why I get up every morning, um, because I want churches to thrive. I want them to be healthy. Mm-hmm. I want them to thrive. And yet, this is what churches are telling us. They're stuck. And uh, we want, that's, that's why we do what we do. It's why we create all the content we create. It's why we engage with churches through our consulting process, the unstuck process, we want churches to get on the other side of that life cycle and to start experiencing health again. And here's the good news for the, the largest chunk of the churches that are on the declining side of the life cycle, they're in maintenance right now. What we have found is the shifts that they need to make, the changes they need to make, they're doable. The challenge mm. is if you wait until you're in preservation or life support, Those changes then at that point to get back to a place where you're experiencing health again are significant. Yeah, you almost need a lung transplant or a heart transplant at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why, I mean, we want to help all churches wherever they are on this life cycle, but especially those churches that indicate we're in maintenance right now. Those are the ones we love to work with. We want to work with them because... Uh, you know, th- there are some necessary changes that are going to be required to, to return back to health, but the changes are doable. And uh, we've seen a number of churches that are willing to do that. And because of that, now they're starting to see the fruit of that investment. So, yeah, uh, there's we have we have plenty of work to do, Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are those changes in the last quarter now a year into the crisis? Are they significantly different than they were, say, two years ago, three years ago? Or it's basically the same. The churches that are growing are still growing. Churches that are stuck and declining are still stuck and declining. Yeah, I mean, time will tell. I think I mean, we're still we're still actually in the pandemic. I know several churches, yeah. especially in your part of the world, are still, you know. No, we're in the grips right now. As that's we right. This. Yeah, so I mean, we're still in it. I think we're going to, time will tell uh, the real impact that this has had on the church more broadly. But I'm still of the opinion that what we've experienced is just going to accelerate what churches were already seeing pre-pandemic. And what we know is, unfortunately, um, Carrie, in the decades pre-pandemic, there was a steep decline that was happening, not only with church membership and church attendance, 
but more and more people were indicating they don't they don't have faith in Jesus. Uh, the nuns mm. continue to grow, and so has has COVID helped us somehow reverse any of that? Gosh, I pray that that's the case, and I hope that's the case. But my suspicion is what we've experienced in the last 12 months is probably only going to accelerate those trends. And I don't look at that as, oh my, the church is not going to survive because I know the end of the story. I do see this as a pivotal time for the church to reassess its mission, to ask God, what do you have for us next? And then to make sure we have a strategy of next steps so that we're, we're, we're going to hopefully begin to reverse some of those trends that we've been seeing. And in, particularly as it relates to our next generations. I mean, you look at some of, some of the stats, my parents' generation, my generation, now my kids' generation, it's dramatic, the decline mm -hmm. that's, that is happening. And the church has an opportunity to truly become a multi-generational church where we don't have the older folks in traditional services and my generation and some form of contemporary, we call it contemporary, but it's not contemporary. <laughs> that was contemporary and 30 years we ago. We try to yeah. have this other thing that somehow the the millennials will start to come to. That that is not a multi-generational church. And I just think there's opportunity for us to revisit the strategies that we're engaging so that we can continue to reach our kids. And then eventually I'm planning to have grandkids. That's, that's the plan. Anyways, <laughs> Carrie. But eventually I want the church to thrive for my kids and my grandkids. And so this is the opportunity. I look at it as an opportunity before us, but COVID was a huge disruption for church ministries. Yeah. And like I said, it has probably accelerated some of the trends that we were seeing pre COVID. Okay, I really want to drill down on online, and I got a whole bevy of questions for you if you're ready, Tony. So um, what were some of the best uh, practices of churches and organizations that embrace digital? Like you do you do have a broad view. I'd love to know, like, it, and this can be pre-COVID too. Like just what, what are like, man, these guys are crushing it when they do X. What is X? Yeah, so what we're seeing, and this is, I would argue these are kind of the best practice churches now as it relates to digital strategy is they're looking at more of a long-term view of someone's spiritual journey. And so mm. um, actually just uh, within the last year, I started to reflect on my personal spiritual journey from a point where I wasn't interested in faith, certainly wasn't interested in connecting to a church, long series of steps, but I would, I would suggest that I moved from being not interested to being spiritually curious. And I started to ask some of those questions that I referred to earlier. And, uh, there are a lot of people that, um, that spent many, many hours, many, many days and months with me to unpack scripture, point me towards Jesus front through that process. I actually moved from being spiritually curious to becoming a new believer in, in Jesus. And then connecting with a church and being discipled and then moving from being discipled to be a, being a disciple maker. And so there are others uh, that have, I think there's an angle scale out there that goes it's a, a little bit more detailed, but broadly mm -hmm. I was looking at my spiritual, spiritual journey and these, these five steps, not interested to spiritually curious to becoming a new believer to being discipled and then becoming a disciple maker. And what I'm seeing as far as best practices for churches when it comes to digital strategy is they're thinking about all of those steps when they design mm. their digital strategy. And what that means then is they're not just relying on their online services to help people take all five of those steps. They're recognizing there are going to be a lot of baby steps that happen both before someone engages a service online and then hopefully after someone engages a service online as well. So th those it's are a lot bigger the than the email capture. That I'm seeing. Yeah. A lot bigger than the email capture and a lot more than just, Whoa, we got, you know, 2000 people watching the message right now. That's right. That's absolutely yeah. right. Okay. That's good to know. Some of the worst practices you've seen. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, when it comes to worst practices, maybe uh, it's just uh, maybe a void that exists when churches mm. start to think about digital strategy in that they're only thinking about people that are a part of their church today. And they're not thinking about the people that aren't yet a part of their church and may not even be a part of the faith yet. And so they're not thinking about that broad, again, mission that God's called us to, to make disciples of Jesus. And, uh, and so this is the opportunity I think for most churches is to consider the broader spiritual journey and, uh, to consider how does our digital strategy start to engage people before they show up to our church and before they put their faith in Jesus. Yeah. Um, one of the things, I don't know that you saw this or not, it could just be based on my feed, but it felt like a year ago, you know, first, second quarter of 2020, a lot of churches were like very seven day a week. It's like daily devotions, prayer rooms, you know, Sunday service, uh, on demand content. And then it felt like over the summer, somehow everybody just snapped back to the weekend. And now it's like, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me. Did, did you see that trend as well? And any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we look, I think for too long, we've looked at our digital strategy, our online strategy as a pr promotions platform mm -hmm. rather than a way for us to connect with people. And and so this is uh, one of the things I've appreciated. I think you've had Nona either on your podcast, mm -hmm. Nona Jones on your podcast or in some of the other content that you're creating. And uh, I love her book, Social Media to Social Ministry, um, because it's helping churches recognize there's a person on the other side of that website. There's a person on the other side of that Facebook update. Um, it's not just a promotions platform for the church. Digital, digital platforms are a way for us to connect with people. And mm -hmm. so... Um, this is the opportunity we have. It's to maybe shift our thinking. And we saw this a bit with websites 10 years ago where churches were only using their website to promote, this is who we are, this is where we, where we meet, this is the time that we meet. They started to take a more holistic view as it relates to their websites. Well, now I think we need to look more broadly at the entire digital strategy again it's social media, it is web strategy, it's things like podcasting and video and all of those things combined, texting strategies and so on. We need to look at that more holistically and rather than looking at it all as just a promotions tool to let the world know, here we are, this is where we meet, this is when we meet, to actually think about the people on the other side of that and how do we how do we engage with them? Where are they in their lives right now? How do we help them take mm. a next step toward faith and toward the church? And so it feels very this, old school. This, what's that? Except digital said it feels very old school, except it's digital. That's right. And that's what I, I this is, I think churches, I mean, when they start to realize, oh, we're just, we're still on the same mission. We're still trying to engage the same people. Then it doesn't become so intimidating. Um, I, I remember years ago when I was at Granger Community Church, we were going through a building campaign only. We weren't supposed to call it that. Uh, I can't. <sighs> you're, you're, uh, the campaign, people tell you, don't call it a campaign. But it was a building campaign. <laughs> but the whole theme of that campaign was this. It's not about the building. It's about the people. The reason why we're doing this is because we want to continue to reach more and more people for Jesus. And in this season, what I want churches to think about, it's not about the website. It's not about Facebook. It's not about mm. Twitter. It's not about Instagram. It's about people. And I think when we go back to that foundation and recognize, oh, goodness, on the other side of that screen is somebody that's just trying to figure out how to live life. And they may not know yet that Jesus is critical to their purpose, to on that unconditional love that they need in their life, to the, the community of believers that can really support them wherever they are in, in life's journey. They don't know that they need that yet, but there's a person on the other side of that screen, and that's the mission that God's called us to. And so I just, again, I actually think, man, there is so much opportunity for churches once they realize 
it's still about the mission. It's just in a different <laughs> environment. And we already know how to carry out the mission God's called us to. We just need to figure out how to translate that to a different environment. Okay. I want to go lightning round on you with a number of questions to try to get them in, if that's okay you up for that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk metrics, multiplier or no multiplier. And for those who may not know what that is, let me give context. So uh, let's say your YouTube video has 100 views. We'll just pick a very conservative number, 100 views. Do you just count 100 or do you multiply that by 1.7? Because Tony might be watching with his wife and maybe <laughs> one of his kids is watching and that kind of thing. Multiplier or no multiplier? I'm a no multiplier guy. Uh, I, here, to here. me, it's kind of like the NFL. Uh, last year, they had 92 million viewers of the Super Bowl. They didn't try to estimate how many people were in my living room to figure out what the overall attendance was <laughs> for the Super Bowl. They didn't do yeah. that. That What they are doing and they should be doing is monitoring why in the world have they dropped to 92 million viewers from 114 million viewers only five years ago. There's been a 20% drop in Super Bowl, Super Bowl viewers. So they oh, should wow. be monitoring that statistic rather than trying to guess what their attendance was in people's living rooms. I'm so glad to hear you. I've, I've become a no multiplier guy. And you know, it hit me that that NFL analogy is really good because you might be watching with three of your friends. I may have walked out of the room and left the TV on. Like you really don't know, right? You don't know. You don't know. And then I thought, why? Because you and I are both podcasters. I don't know why this just hit me recently. It's like, well, I'm sure some people listen on the commute and I'm sure some people listen on Alexa at dinner and maybe there was someone else in the room who heard this. And so why can't I take my numbers and multiply them by two? It's like no podcaster thinks that way, mm -hmm. but pastors have to have a multiplier. Like, what is that? Yeah. So the bottom line here for me is let's just count the number of views and then monitor that over time because that will tell us is our strategy for engaging our online audience actually working and the bottom line too is what figure out whatever the baseline measure is so if it's only one minute or 10 minutes or whatever yeah. it is figure out what your baseline measure is monitor that over time the key thought here is whatever we measure should help us make better decisions and so what mm. we're looking for here is are those baseline measures that help us monitor over time is our strategy working or not? And if it's not, how can we tweak it? How can we improve the strategy so that we can engage more people? Yeah, that's fair. And if you just keep, keep a simple number, you're right. You're watching. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it changing from week to week, et cetera? Okay. Other things to measure that you think are important because you can measure yeah. so much. Yeah. So uh, again, I don't try to measure everything. I, I always share the illustration. I'm a baseball nut, Kerry. Mm. I've even been to Canada to watch a couple of baseball games they, We're building when they used park. to let us across the border. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, um, when, you are, when you're at a baseball game, you're watching the scoreboard to know whether or not your team is winning. But when you're right. a baseball nut like me, after the game, you dig into the box score and it has mm. all kinds of additional stats and about the individual and the team and so on. Churches, don't worry about all the details of the box score. Just identify those key metrics that are going to let us know, are we winning or not? And I would encourage you to, again, go back to that spiritual journey that I was talking about earlier. Mm and just identify what's one next step that we can be tracking that helps us understand if people are actually making steps, seeing movement on that spiritual journey. Okay. Um, best practices for engagement. We talked about it a little bit, but is there anything else that really helps people? Because you're right. It's not just broadcasting. It's like, let's try to draw people into a dialogue in a relationship. Yeah, so I, I would just encourage you to be thinking about not just engaging church people, but there's actually two types of engagement as a ministry that we need to be thinking about, engaging people of the faith and people that aren't a part of the faith yet. And right. I um, actually am grateful for the disruption that we experienced in this last year because before covid it seems seemed to me, Carrie, that all of the conversation around engagement in churches was connected to engaging people that were already a part of the church. Mm. And so my challenge is let's think about both types of types of engagement, uh, both for church people that are taking next steps toward Christ, 
but also for folks that aren't yet part of the church and aren't part of the faith and the steps that they're taking toward Jesus as well. Uh, I loved your interview on your podcast with the team over at Sun Valley Church. And where is that? That's mid like the They're in the Phoenix Sun area. Dome. Yeah. Multiple Phoenix. locations in Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, they were kind of on, on the edge and we'll link to those episodes in the show notes of, you know, churches that were thinking ahead. But um, what would you say to churches when they're thinking about staffing for the future and who they need to hire? Like where, where for churches that have those kinds of resources or if they're looking for a volunteer, who should they be targeting to help them with this? Yeah, so uh, you need to think about first, what's our strategy? And if the strategy does include digital ministry, then you need to build a team around that strategy. Yeah. And for larger churches, that team probably is going to include some people that you pay, some staff people, and some volunteers as well. For smaller churches, that may be primarily volunteers. And again, I referred mm. to Nona Jones' book earlier, but I mean, she in her book, she's really encouraging churches to build teams of volunteers that are engaging that digital strategy. So you don't have to be a big church with a big staff in order to do this. But you do have to be intentional about making sure that you have a team around your digital strategy, just like you have teams built for your physical environments. Okay, that's good to know. Um, you, you usually hire from the marketplace. Like church staffs are not currently burgeoning with digital media people who are ready to make a move, right? That's right, yeah. So for uh, Sun Valley, as an example, they hired somebody from the marketplace, somebody he loves Jesus. He, he's mm. been in, in the church, um, um, but he has the specialized experience and the specialized skill set to help the church establish their digital ministry strategy. And here's the good news. It, it's 2021. And in your churches, there are people that do this sort of thing for a living. They may not do mm -hmm. the whole thing for a living, but they do a piece of it. And mm -hmm. so it is, it's an opportunity for us to be looking at folks in our church that are coming from the marketplace to engage the ministry. Specifically, of course, here we're talking about digital ministry strategy, yeah. but there are likely people in your church that are already doing this for a living. So in-person church attendance currently is 28% lower than it used to be. Uh, I'd love your thoughts on future church attendance. Is it going back to pre-pandemic levels? Why, why not? What do you think? Yeah, so if you're asking the question, will people who, attend, who attended church pre-COVID not go back to church because they've been watching it online? I don't buy that. Um, mm. I, I actually don't buy the argument that we've been training people to watch church online. And so now they're not going to come back. Um, I, again, I just think people are going to crave being around other people. And so it's going to take time. Uh, I just looked at, uh, there was some research, the American psychological association put out in recent weeks indicating, um, even in current days as the vaccine is rolling out close to 50% of people are really hesitant in this moment to get back to in-person gatherings across, across our culture. Even the vaccinated and, are still like, eh, I don't know. That's right. So it's going to take, it's going to take some time, but I think the people that were a part of our physical gatherings are going to want to come back. Now there is a broader question here. Um, will, will that somehow reverse the attendance trends that we were seeing pre pandemic and i would say no i, I don't so you'll I see don't, an interruption in it and then just the steady decline yeah i i still see this the steady decline happening mm. unless churches begin to revisit their strategy and so there's opportunity there and not all churches are in decline right now there are a lot of churches that are continuing to reach more people in fact in the data i was looking at uh, that we talked about earlier Carrie, yeah, yeah. i was talking or looking through some of the specific churches among those close to 200 churches that responded and it was amazing to me that even in the pandemic there were a number of churches that experienced growth in this last year yeah. So yeah. there are growing churches out there. Not all churches are in decline, but if you look at the church holistically, there's an there's a trend that's been happening for many decades that it's not going to we can't just hope it and pray it away. We need to engage our mission in a unique way. Mm. Okay, a couple more questions for you. 
Any thoughts on distributed gatherings? And by those, I mean micro churches, home gatherings connected to the church, micro campuses, uh, different expressions than in gathering in a facility that seats hundreds or thousands on a Sunday. Yeah, so I know there have been churches that have been kind of test driving different models of this. Mm-hmm. And what I would say, Carrie, is I think they're still test driving. We haven't seen <laughs> yeah. long term impact of this yet. And I always, um, I've always thought, man, I I want to be teaching other churches. I want to be influencing other leaders based on things that I know are successful. I know they've worked right. for other churches. And the problem is I just don't know yet. Um, not I enough mean, evidence. Actually, enough some early record. signs that I've seen is there's some challenge to approaching church that way. And uh, we'll see. Will, will other churches figure out how to overcome some of those challenges? Maybe. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've been in ministry now, I think 25, 30 years, I guess I'm getting to be an old guy, Carrie, but -hmm. this whole dream of the church being distributed and meeting in people's homes, that's been around for a long time. And yet I've not actually seen, especially large churches be able to engage that and still carry out the full mission of reaching people for Jesus. And so what are some of the challenges? What are some of the challenges just real quick with that? That you see. Uh, well, some of it has to do with being able to provide age appropriate ministry in smaller contexts. Right. So right. the adults may be served well, but maybe not the whole family. Um, I think pretty quickly what I've seen in churches that have dabbled in this is it becomes kind of insider focused and we stop mm-hmm. thinking about reaching our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, because we like our gathering in our home. Um, so those are a couple. Um, I, yeah. when you do distributed church, it, it, it's a challenge to keep the church aligned too, and, and that keep the church on mission. And so we've actually seen cases of division that have occurred in those situations. So there, I mean, again, I don't know, maybe some churches will figure out how to overcome some of those challenges. I just think they're, they're still in test drive mode and it's really too early to tell if there's an opportunity there. Okay, what would you say to church leaders who are like, I know we're still sort of pandemic-y and people are nervous, but one day it's going to open up and things will go back to normal. What's a word for them? Yeah, so uh, one day it will open up, but I don't know if we're ever going to return to the normal that we knew before, but that's always been the case. I mean, uh, this the culture around us, it's evolving and people are people's lives are changing. And so we, we live in a different world today than we did five years ago, 10 years ago. And so I, I, you know, part of me is almost thankful. I mean, I'm not thankful for all of the millions Mm. of people that have been impacted by this illness, um, in so many different ways, but it is, it is, uh, this disruption is an opportunity for the church to, again, to revisit the mission that God's called us to. And the way I've shared it, um, is my concern is many times the reason why the church gets stuck is the way we do church becomes more important than why we do church. Mm. And I hope that through this disruption, we go back to answering the first, the question, why, why do we engage the mission that God's called us to? And we become a little bit more open-handed with the way that we do church. Good. You know what? It's a good point. Like I just wrote down, normal dies every year, right? That's true. Normal dies every year. What was normal in 2006 is not normal in 2007. And, you know, we got a big death (laughs) in the pandemic of what normal was. Uh, Mm -hmm. But every year, normal dies. Um, Okay. Any other factors when it comes to the future, which is a hybrid model for churches and businesses, and we've really doubled down on church because that's your expertise. But right, we end up with um, you know the, a good example. I gave it once before, I think, of this podcast. But our garden center, who only really was analog until a year ago, uh, my wife at the beginning of the pandemic ordered all of our flowers online, and they spent March building a website. And now all of a sudden they're a hybrid business, right? We'll deliver to your door. What do you want? And takeout is up and churches have their online ministries that most are not shutting down. Any final thoughts on hybrid models moving forward? Yeah, uh, I know for some businesses, uh, they're going to they're gonna be able to move completely online and thrive yeah. in business. Uh, for the church, this is the challenge we have. We, we have to do both. We, because we're in the people business, 
we need to be invested in physical ministry environments to help people take their next step toward Christ. And I believe because the times that we're living in and the fact that the people we're trying to reach are living so much of their life online, we need to be invested in that online strategy, those online environments as well to help people take their next steps toward Christ. And so uh, what I don't want people to hear in this conversation is Tony's kind of given up on people showing up to church and given up mm. on physical gatherings. That could be the furthest thing from the truth. What I'm suggesting, though, is we have a bigger challenge than other oh, yeah. or organizations and institutions because we need to figure out how to do both well if we're going to be able to live out the mission God's called us to. Now, well, Tony, this has been a thrill. I know it won't be the last time. Um, so where can they, can they find you online? And then uh, I, I bet you some people want to get that report. So what's, yeah. we'll link to it in the show notes, but just so they have the direct hit up as well. Yeah, so you can find out more about what we're doing to serve churches and see all of that free content, too, that we were talking about a little yeah, bit yeah, ago yeah. at the unstuckgroup.com. And if you want the the report, which will be delivered to your inbox every quarter, it's the unstuckgroup.com slash subscribe. Okay, Tony, thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.